open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for these ladies that have come together, that we can learn what you have to say to us today about fasting. And Lord, I just, um, well, I haven't studied this myself before, and so it's, it's new to me in some ways. I mean, I've done some research on it, but I've not really studied it. But Lord, I do want to draw closer to you. And Lord, I just pray that the same would be for the ladies here, that they would have this desire to draw closer to your heart and get to know you better. And I just thank you for their they're coming and participating. And Lord, I just pray that what is said and spoken today would reach our hearts and do what you want to accomplish in each of our lives. And I thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. And before you start, mm -hmm. we do want to just sing happy birthday to you. So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cindy. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, our topic today is when the bridegroom is taken away, they will fast with new wineskins. And so, the new wineskins thing sounds like it's totally changing subjects. But we're going to see what it has to do with this. So um, we're in Matthew 9, 14 through 17 today. And we'll listen to, we'll listen to the lecture, and then we will discuss it a little bit later. I, I didn't. I, I, that was mine. I, I, I was in it. I mean, <coughs> sorry. 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 I just sometimes. Okay. I apologize. I didn't sure I have this on I don't think it's on, but sometimes it, it doesn't turn off. Okay, here we go. That's not what I on the atmosphere. Is that the same thing? Yes. Oh, uh, no. No. Actually, yes, it does. I think. I don't know. You have a different song than me. What is happening here? Have I done something wrong? I got, I got that in. Okay. That's too easy. It was just the one thing that needed to be turned on, right? Oh, shoot. I just can't figure this thing out. I don't even see any buttons coming on. Your husband's in the sound booth where he was. There goes something. Is the projector on? We don't need the projector. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. We're listening. Okay, I'm going to go get Marty. This is a stick. I'm going to go with the phone. The conference this weekend. It was called Firestorms. Okay. And there was a pet. Maybe I get one. I'm not even going to put it in the I'll call it Sean because I wanted my giant. Have you heard of him? He was no, part of I've never heard of him. He was part of the Reawaken America batch. He's the one with the long flowing curly blonde hair. I'm trying to get this down. He has pushed to push several pieces of this thing and call it coming. Worship services on the beach in downtown New York and all over the nation. And he went to every town. Oh, I know what it is. Oh, oh man, it's cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. You were like, I'm not. I don't want to go into detail, but it was good. It was up at home. She's packing. Okay. Now they can go here. She's not doing anything. It's cool. She's always So behind me, and there's a lot of things. I wrote it down on my channel. I know it's good. And yet, there's a little section on fasting. Matthew 9, 14 through 17. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. 
for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do men put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh new wineskins, and they are both preserved. Last week, I called you all to a special corporate way of fasting for January. I suggested that we, from supper on Tuesday evening to supper on Wednesday evening, each Wednesday of January, fast, skipping breakfast and lunch on Wednesday and thus devoting those times, if possible, to focused times of meditation on the Word and prayer. Now, fasting is new for some of you, but I want you to realize that it is new for the Christian church. There's a little document called the Didache, which was written at the end of the first century, give or take a decade probably. And in it, there's a little section on fasting. One verse in it goes like this. Let not your fasts be with the hypocrites, for they fast on Mondays and Thursdays. But do you fast on Wednesdays and Fridays? Now that seems strange in a way. A big deal, huh? But I think the point of the early church was the Jewish custom was to do it Sabbath on Saturday, we're going to do ours on Sunday when he rose from the dead, they do their fasting on those days, and we're going to do our fasting on this day, to, to try to say yes, yes to something that's there and value, but no to something else, kind of a both end, ambivalent attitude, we'll take it, but we'll change it, and we'll come back to that idea, the early church did take it, and they did change it, Epiphanius was a bishop in Italy in the 5th century, and this is what he wrote. Who does not know that the fast of the 4th and 6th days of the week are observed by Christians throughout the whole world? So in the 5th century, Epiphanius at least was claiming that all Christians fasted everywhere. John Calvin, in the 16th century, said, let us say something about fasting. Because many, for want of knowing its usefulness, undervalue its necessity. And some reject it as almost superfluous. While on the other hand, where the use of it is not well understood, it, is, it easily degenerates into superstition. Holy and legitimate fasting is directed to three ends. For we practice it either as a restraint upon the flesh to preserve it from licentiousness, or as a preparation for prayers and pious meditations, or as a testimony of our humiliation in the presence of God when we are desirous of confessing our guilt before Him. Martin Luther was given the overstatement and body sentences, and this is one of the less body ones, said, of fasting, I say this, it is right to fast frequently in order to subdue and control the body. For when the stomach is full, the body does not serve for preaching or praying or studying or for doing anything else that is good. Under such circumstances, God's word cannot remain. But one should not fast with a view to meriting something by it as by a good work. And I pointed out more recently how South Korea has exploded in church growth through prayers and fastings. I told that in the first service, and a, a fellow came up to me who said, I grew up on the mission field in Korea, and I want to tell you a story that is emblazoned on my mind to show the devotion and the dedication of the praying and fasting in Korea. My father, he said, worked with a leper colony, and they had 4 a.m. prayer meetings, the leper colony. And he was asked one morning, and I was a little boy, and he took me with him at about 3.30 a.m. to get there and sat me in the back, and I could see out the door as these lepers were coming to pray at 4 a.m. And I'll never forget, he said, one man who had no legs, no crutches, 
and was using his hands and crabbing along the ground, dragging his body to the prayer at 4 a.m. And he said, I resolved at that time I would never, never complain about having a hard time getting somewhere to pray. Pretty powerful picture, isn't it? That kind of resolve does break strongholds and release power as it has remarkably in South Korea. My own experience, while not nearly as powerful as I hope it will be, was remarkable this week in seeing breakthroughs through prayer and fasting. I call us as a church to join together corporately in fasting last Wednesday, this Wednesday, and the four Wednesdays of this month in order to pray for awakening and revival in the churches and the advancement of God's kingdom in this city and our denomination and around the world to all the unreached peoples. And I believe if we follow through on that, it will release great, great power. Remember last week, I put my fingers like this and said there's a three-legged stool perhaps for revival in Acts 13, 1 to 3, and one leg is prayer. And there's been great revival in the prayer movement in our day, and another leg is worship. They were praying and worshiping when God moved. And there's been great reawakening in revival in uh, worship in our day. And the third leg, they were fasting, and that leg doesn't exist in most churches today. It's a two-legged stool. And I just raised the possibility I have no claims on God whatsoever to dictate His timing or to twist his arm, but I raise the possibility that biblically, whether or not, there might be a waiting and a watching and a moving on God's part until the church not only prays and not only worships, but fasts, that expresses its longing with fasting. This much, oh God, this much, I want you to come and empower your word and awaken your people and spread your gospel. That's what fasting means to me. To me, fasting is an exclamation point at the end of a sentence. I want your power to be displayed. I am hungry for your power. I am hungry for a revelation of, it, of, of your glory. And then you, you give an exclamation point this much by skipping two meals and saying that much more. That much, I mean it. I mean it. It's like, I didn't plan to say this here, but it comes to my mind. It's like Abraham's offering of Isaac. Does it ever boggle your mind that the Lord came to him at the end and says, Now I know that you love me above your son. Well, God knew that. But there was a knowing experientially. There was a seeing knowing. There was a watching knowing. There was a knowing being worked out in the experience of Abraham as he lifted the knife over his son. Now all you have to do is lift the knife over a meal. <coughs> this much I love you. This much I need you. This much our church wants you. And I will pass by, if not my son, breakfast and and lunch. And then I got a letter in the mail this week, a very good letter and a reminder, and I want to throw it out lest you uh, opt out for wrong reasons. A woman said, um, I'm, I'm behind this, I think God's in it, it doesn't work for me on Wednesday. When my, I'm with people over lunch every day. I'm running, in other words, Wednesday doesn't work, breakfast and lunch doesn't work. Here's what she wrote. So I have a couple of things I believe are from the Spirit that may be more of a fast for some than food. I thought that not watching television for a week or a month or a night of the week when I normally watch it might be more of a fast than food. Instead of watching my favorite program, I might spend the time talking and listening to God. I wonder if there might be others for whom this would be a fast and would be a focused time of prayer for them. So I say amen to that. And don't consider yourself out of the loop if you immediately say, oh, that's it. Wednesdays don't work for me. That's okay. If your heart is right, and you're open to the Lord, and you're asking Him, well, draw me into the spirit of awakening through fasting, He'll show you. He'll show you when and how. If your health doesn't work for, for that, 
If the doctor says no fasting for you, that's, that's fine. The, the great physician knows all about that. And something else will work. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones preached a great sermon on fasting when he was doing his series on the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, fasting, if we conceive it truly, must not be confined to the question of food and drink. Fasting should really be made to include abstinence from anything which is legitimate in and of itself for the sake of some special spiritual purpose. There are many bodily functions which are right and normal, perfectly legitimate, but which for special peculiar reasons in certain circumstances should be controlled. That is fasting. So I just offer to you the spirit of fasting, the call for fasting, and if Wednesday doesn't work, something else will work. Now what I want to do this morning and next Sunday morning is take us to the words of Jesus, the master teacher, the authority of our lives, and ask, what do you have to say to us, Jesus, about fasting? We've heard something from Acts. We're going to be looking at other places, but let's go to Jesus this morning, and Jesus next Sunday morning, and see what he has to say about fasting. And we're going to look at Matthew 9, 14 to 17. Richard Foster wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. It's got a great chapter on fasting. And uh, in it, he said this verse, verse 15 of Matthew 9, is perhaps the most important statement in the New Testament on whether Christians should fast or not. So if you're asking yourself the question, should I? Is it something God is calling me to do? Is the voice of the living Christ in this call that the pastor is issuing? Listen for it in these verses. Verse 14, the disciples of John the Baptist come. They come to Jesus and they say, Why are you and your disciples not fasting? Because we, John, are fasting, and the Pharisees fast. In fact, Judaism fast. Everybody in the Old Testament fasted. Here, you're not fasting. What's going on? So evidently, during the years of Jesus' ministry, he wasn't fasting. And his disciples weren't fasting. Why not? He answers with a word picture. Verse 15. The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? Now that sentence teaches one simple thing and one absolutely stunning thing. The simple thing is Jesus connected the old fasting with mourning, crying, aching, yearning, sadness. It was used mostly in the Old Testament on days when you tear your clothes and you put ashes on your head and you, you cry out because your sins were so great or you were surrounded by armies or something terrible was happening. And he was saying, uh, that's the way fasting is. And here's the second thing he was teaching. The bridegroom is here. The bridegroom is here. What does that mean? This is awesome. I mean, if you have ears to hear, hear right now. Because not, not many of them heard words like this. You know, Jesus did not very often come right out and say, I'm God, shake up. He very seldom made those kinds of explicit claims about himself. Things that Jesus said were sort of cloaked at times when he lifted his claim to the highest point. This is a stunning claim. Who's the bridegroom of Israel in the Old Testament? Isaiah 62, Ezekiel 16, Hosea chapter 2. God is the husband and the bridegroom of Israel. God betrothed Israel to himself with covenant love. He found her sweltering in her blood. And he blessed her, and he came along, and she was naked and full and ready for love. And he spread his skirt over her and betrothed her to himself in love and made her cling to him as his bride. That's the bridegroom. And Jesus says, you don't fast when he comes. Some dusty road, some ordinary afternoon, some out-of-the-way part of Palestine... An ordinary Jewish teacher says, the reason my disciples don't fast is because you don't fast when the bridegroom is here. Get it. That's the 
the way Jesus does. It should have been an earthquake. The sky should have split. The stars should have fallen. The dead should have risen. God was here. The bridegroom of Israel is here. And his point is, it's too good. It's too good. It's like a wedding. It's like a party. It's the most stunning thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. You can't tear your clothes and fast and put ashes on your head. It is too good. That's why my disciples are not fasting. It's an amazing claim that he's making. Then he says, But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Here are the key words for us this morning. Then they will fast. Then they will fast. When is that? One interpretation says he was taken away on Good Friday and hung on the cross and put in a tomb. And of course, you fast when the Son of God is killed and put in a tomb. Of course, you, you fast for those three days. But then he's back at the resurrection and you don't fast anymore because he's here. You think that's the right interpretation? I don't. The days are coming when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then, when? Just three days between Good Friday and Easter morning? Then they will fast. Two reasons I don't think that's the case, but rather, I think what he means is, Jesus was taken away from them, yes, in the cross, but also in the ascension back to heaven, and he isn't here in a very profound, desired sense. Now, two reasons for why I think that's the interpretation and not the other. One is, that's the way the early church understood it, including Paul, because they were fasting in Acts 13. They fasted at the beginning of every church plant. Paul fasted over and over again, according to 2 Corinthians 6 and 2 Corinthians 11. And the whole early church after the New Testament fasted. The early church did not understand Jesus that way. And I'm very slow to go against the understanding of the apostles. And the early church. Second reason. The next time and the only other time the bridegroom is used in the book of Matthew. is chapter 25. You all know this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a bridegroom who's gone away. And when he comes, the voice is sounded. Prepare for the bridegroom's arrival. And then there are ten virgins. And five have oil in their lamps, and five don't have oil in their lamps. And the five get ready to come. And what's it a picture of? It's a picture of the second coming, not Easter. The time of the absence of the bridegroom is from the ascension to the second coming. And therefore, when Jesus says, the days are coming when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast. He is calling Bethlehem Baptist Church to fast. This is the closest you'll get to a command in the New Testament to fast. It isn't a command. It's a prophecy. And you have to ask yourself in your heart right now, do I want to be a part of the fulfillment of the words of the Lord or do I want not to be a part of them? That's the question. If you're sitting there this morning saying, I don't have to fast, that doesn't have to be part of the Christian experience. I said, fine. But I want you to deal with Jesus, not me. And if Jesus says, the days are coming when my people will fast, do you want to say to him, well, not me? I'll let your prophecy be fulfilled in John Piper, the staff, or somebody else, but not me. And I, I just encourage you not to opt out of the fulfillment of that prophecy. Because Jesus says, the sons or the attendants of the bridegroom are going to fast. Be a part of the group. Please. But he's here, some say. He's here. I mean, are you minimizing the presence of the Lord by the, the Spirit of Christ in our hearts and in our midst? 
I hope I'm not, and you'll hear that I'm not before we're done. But let me direct your attention. You don't need to look this up. So 2 Corinthians 5 8, where Paul says, We prefer to be apart from the body and at home with the Lord. What does that mean? That means when you're in the body, you're away from the Lord. And when you're away from the body, you're at home with the Lord. Which means that if you're a Christian this morning, there's homesickness in your heart. Is there? If you're a Christian this morning and you're alive, there's homesickness in your heart. You want Jesus. If you say to me, I have Jesus. So when you don't know the experience of the Apostle Paul, if you don't know the homesickness for Jesus, and you have the homesickness precisely because you have Jesus. If you didn't know Jesus, if he weren't there stirring you up, you wouldn't feel any homesickness for Jesus. But you don't have all that Jesus is. You don't have all of his glory, all of his power, all of his wonder, all of the intimacy that you will join and join someday. That is yet to come, and there's a homesickness in every heart. And that homesickness is the birthplace of fasting. One of the reasons we don't fast is because we don't feel homesick. In fact, we feel very much at home, at work and at the television, and on vacation and in our hobbies and goofing around. We feel very much at home in this world. And of course, why would you fast? There's no great longing. Then come these stunning, jarring words, if you read them in context. Next verse 16. But no one patches or puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Now be asking yourself as I read this, what's the old garment? What's the patch? What's the old wineskin? What's the new wine? In the context of fasting. For the patch pulls away from the garment and, and a worse tear results. No, nor do men put new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine skins burst and the wine pours out and the wine skins are ruined. And, and, but they put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserved. In the context, What's the old cloth and the old wineskin? Answer, the old fasting. It's the fasting they're not doing. And what's the new wine? The bridegroom has come. The bridegroom has come. Emmanuel, God with us. The lamb is slain. The sins are cursed and covered. The bridegroom is risen. The Spirit is poured out. The bridegroom is moving right now in this room and all over these cities and around the world, gathering a bride spotless to present to himself in glory and splendor someday in his appearing. That's the new wine. And he's saying, if you try to take all this newness, the arrival of the Messiah, the arrival of the bridegroom, the arrival of the King, the sins forgiven, the coming of the Holy Spirit, if you try to take all that finished work and pour it into the old wine skin of fasting, both of them will be ruined. The central, most decisive work of salvation in your life happened 2,000 years ago. With the death of the Son of God on your behalf and with His resurrection from the dead, death was conquered, hell was conquered, sin was conquered, guilt was conquered. A great it is finished was spoken over all of that. That's done. The new wine is here and it is offered and it is drunk and it is enjoyed wherever the king in his finished work is received. Question now, as you can you can see. Verse 15 says, then we will fast when the bridegroom is gone. Verse 17 says, The old fasting cannot contain the new wine of the kingdom. So what's the answer? Do we fast or don't we? And my answer is this. The new wine demands 
new fast. The new wine demands a new kind of and a new spirit of fasting. In my Greek Testament, years ago, I wrote in the margin, I read yesterday, again after some years, I wrote in the margin these words, beside verse 17. The new fasting is based on the mystery of the kingdom that the bridegroom has come, not just will come, which was the foundation of the old fasting. The new wine of his presence calls for a new fasting. The old fasting was a yearning, a longing, an aching that was not based on the already finished wonderful coming of the bridegroom and the finished work of his atonement for sin and the conquering of death and the deliverance from hell and the rising from the dead and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All that was future for the old fasting. All of it is past for the new fasting. And so every time we fast now, it grows out of a fantastic drinking of the new wine that we have already tasted. That the Spirit is here this morning. Christ is here this morning. Sins are forgiven this morning. Death is conquered this morning. Guilt is finished this morning. The doors of heaven are open this morning. Hell is closed to us this morning. The new wine is precious. If you try to fit it into the old fasting, it will shatter everything. But the new fasting is different because that decisive, saving, hope-giving, future-opening work is done. And it is past. So what's new? What's new about it? I suppose the best way to say it is something like this. You can hunger for something because you just smell it and have never tasted it. Or you could hunger for something maybe not quite truly if you just hear about it. Somebody says, have you ever tasted... Gazorian Black, which is the word I just made up. <laughs> and you might say, well, I don't know what I'm hungry for, I've never tasted it. But the kind of hungering that comes in the new fasting, that the new fasting expresses, is a hunger based on having already tasted the divine. The reason we cry out, come Holy Spirit, is because he's come. And we've tasted him, and he's in us. The reason we cry out, come Jesus, manifest the fullness of your glory, is because in the gospel we've seen his glory. The reason we cry out, come revive your church, is not because we're dead, but because there's just enough life for us to know what real life might be. Does that make sense? That the new fasting is not a desperate craving, hopeless, oh might he help us but rather is rooted in the absolute deep confidence and assurance that he is there. Finished at Calvary, risen from the dead, there by the Holy Spirit in my life, and when I cry to him, it is a cry for more. I have tasted the powers of the age to come, and therefore I want more. So I invite you, I urge you, to join us in the new fasting. The new fasting at Bethlehem. The new fasting around the world. Don't fast in order to earn anything from God. God has so decisively demonstrated his love for the world and his finished taking care of sin at Calvary and his mighty triumph over death and his readiness to bring all good things into your life that all you need to do is take your stand on that, taste it and drink it, and then as the desires grow, and it, it is just remarkable, is it not, that the most mature people in Christ I have ever met are the hungriest for him? You'd think that the people that eat longest would be most non-hungry. That's not the way it works with an infinite fountain and an infinitely glorious Lord. And so when you take your stand on that finished work and you begin to drink up the river of life and you taste the bread of life and it begins to satisfy your heart, you get hungrier for God. 
The older you get in Christ, the hungrier you get, the more homesick you get for heaven, the more you want revival, the more you want fullness in your life, the more you want to be done with sin, the more you want to see churches in the city revived and awakened, the more you want to see the gospel spread to the unreached peoples. If you don't feel strong desires right now, you haven't drunk deeply. And so I beckon you, drink and feed and let the hunger and the thirst come. And then, Wednesday by Wednesday, let's express that hunger to God from our bodies and say, this much, oh God, this much we want you in our families, this much we want you in our souls, our church, our city, our nation, and the other peoples. Let's pray. Lord, as we close, we want to express a hunger to you. Would you please come out at the end of the service and seal the work you've been doing in people's hearts right now? I pray for unbelievers whom you've awakened to taste, that they would drink deeply now by faith, that they would receive the covenant love of God in their lives and accept him as the bridegroom and king of their lives, never to be the same again. I pray for believers, Lord, who are wrestling with this whole issue of prayer in their lives and where fasting fits that they hear the call of Jesus, then they will fast. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would quicken our hunger now to dwell in your presence, that you would shower from heaven a thirst for your reign. So, do you have any questions or comments or what we just listened to? What is the best, um, if you were going to be doing like a 21 day fasting day, what is, what is the best type of thing to drink? That, we're not going to discuss that in this Bible study right here. That's going to be more discussed in the nutrition stuff because it doesn't, that, that's not stuff that's covered by the Bible. So I'm going to push that off onto the other stuff. But what I want to discuss right now is what we just learned about in this in this um, presentation here, okay. in this sermon. But we will talk about that, but not right here. Okay? Okay. Okay. Questions, comments? Was anything new to you that you hadn't thought of? I heard it's good bridegroom. You know, I mean, I heard it so many times in church, but it was read so many times, and uh, I just never, I never thought about it. Just, yeah. Um, as when, when I was reading it this week, um, I, kept, I kept asking it. <laughs> God, please tell me who the diagram is. <laughs> and he was telling me, and I wasn't listening. <laughs> And one thing that wasn't really pointed out here is in the Old Testament, over and over, Israel is spoken of as the wife of God, that she's the wife, the unfaithful wife. Hosea really points out that she was the unfaithful wife and how he kept going after her and bringing her back and all of these things. But in the New Testament, I go around and around with people on... Um, this in this one group about about that, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, why does Jesus have to be uh, have to marry the church? It's because it's in the scripture, uh, and I give them the scripture thing, right? And they say, well, what about how come you're like separating them from Israel? And I'm saying I'm not. Uh, Israel is is uh, uh, God's bride from the in the Old Testament. The people before Jesus came. Uh, were the were the bride of of uh, God in the Old Testament before Jesus came? So I'm not really separating the uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're there to get, and I go around, and it's like, and, and then I tell them about the communion and everything, and it's like they have literal blinders on, mm -hmm. and and and, and you, you can't really pull that blinder away, and and expose, you know, because they. They they'll, they'll go around and around about the Passover and and how it was an I image a shadow mm -hmm. of all of this right mm -hmm. and I'll go around and around and, and and they literally still it's like how can you miss it 
they literally have blinders on you. Mm -hmm. You can't peel that off. It's like something glued it to their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Jesus said that. He yeah. said that they would have blinders on. Yeah. But so in the Old Testament, uh, Israel was like the, the wife of God. Okay. That, and he referred to that over and over. But in the New Testament, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. We're betrothed, but we haven't been married. What is the wedding marriage of the Lamb? Marriage, marriage supper of the Lamb. It's coming. It's where, yeah, it's where they went uh -huh. into they went into the um, Father. You know where they painted the blood over the eagle, over the threshold, under the blood of the Lamb. After the Israelites painted on there, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had to eat the lamb inside the house. That's a picture of the marriage supper of the lamb. Yeah. yeah. But a betrothal, mm -hmm. at that time, you were considered married. Yes. And that's why Joseph was so troubled by what went on with Mary, mm -hmm. because in, in the sight of all those people, they were married, and it looked like she was unfaithful. Yeah. So exactly. what was he to do? Right. So God to us... We are betrothed, and it's a done deal in Christ, and that's why this new wineskin, too, because the new has come and replaced the old. Right. So, yeah. She plays the old. the dirty one. Well, that might be something you want to take to the Lord in prayer during your time, oh, yes, you know, and yeah. just ask him to reveal it to you. Of what he's meaning. And because he loves to do that. Wednesday was very interesting. Okay. Do you want to say anything else about it? Just that it was interesting? Or do you want to share anything with the group? No, just different thoughts came. Okay. God was talking to me. Okay. It's also... A when you talk about the new and the old wineskins, it's also that Jesus didn't come to patch up the old covenant right. that they couldn't keep anyway, but to do a whole new thing. And so we had to have new hearts. Mm -hmm. We did. And that was the new wineskin. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting in the original, instead of, um, you know, this version here says, as long as the... Um, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. And they call them attendants of the bridegroom, and that's closer. But original says children of the bridal chamber, and it connects them in a more intimate way. They're not merely guests, because some versions say guests of the bridegroom. So that word guest is not um, as accurate as uh, the attendants or the children of because we're in relationship here and it's an intimate yeah. relationship but it, it makes you really want to go and find out exactly what they used to do what do they mean by children yeah. of the, uh, you yeah. know and, and so and did they actually that. have children that like brought them food or were ready to bring stuff to them but it can also be sons of, okay but it's just showing that they weren't merely right. guests. Right. They were intimate with the bridegroom and invited into that inner mm -hmm. place to wait until the bride comes because they're in there before the bride is, is uh, connected with the how, how, I, how I think on that is, again, the Old Testament people before Jesus was born um, were married to God. Mm -hmm. and. And I think they are the ones that are the guests because it says the guests came also. I'm not saying for sure that they are. I'm just saying that's how I thought on that. Those are some things to think about. So I've been thinking a lot about the wine skin and, mm -hmm. and where the wine skin actually came from and how it was and the meaning of it and the whole Mm -hmm. Putting it together and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. It's really hard to get away from the law, and so that's why he's saying that the wine skins would burst and break because it was the it was the old wine skins, and if you pour, they're they're so involved in the, in uh, following and you know and doing you know works 
that they they really didn't understand the concept of of um, doing them at you know and under you know the, I don't know how to explain it. How do you, how would you explain it? And it's the old wineskins because they're so full of you know following the law, and they even added more things into it where it was it's fat and overfilled even with things that didn't even God didn't even say to do. Right. And, and it was already so right. full that you couldn't right. add more to it. I can't show it just that. Yeah. Okay. Kay Arthur has a very interesting book um, called With an Everlasting Love. And Is that her novel? Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> it's very good. And, and it talks about, you know, that betrothal and... Uh, <coughs> so, With an everlasting. With everlasting Love. And it's especially good um, to show us how much our bride groom loves us, yeah. even though we're unfaithful. Yeah. 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 Do you have that book in your library? Yeah, I have it. Not here, but... Um, uh, I don't think it's in this library, but I have it at mine. I just got to find it. And I've got books in so many I'll, different places. I'll just put it in order. And if you know people that are struggling with, okay, I've sinned so much, how could God love me? How could Christ cover my sins? It's a great book to give to people. Yeah, it could be. Okay, I'm going to change directions just slightly now. There is another um, booklet out that I'm going to cover a little bit from. It's a, on not the same. Um, it's not from John Piper. It's one I gave you last week, Sean. I can't remember the guy's name. I didn't print out the first four pages because it was the title of the book and all of that. And I just did, and, and the last page cut off. I oh, have, it did? Yes, um, the copy you gave me. Oh. I didn't have the whole thing. It was like, darn. <laughs> okay, well, I can give you the last page here because I can, I, I got it here, so I can just, I can just reprint it for you. So, um, he starts off here in 1 Timothy 4, 7, it states, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness. In other words, Christians are to live disciplined lives in order to be more godly so they can make a greater impact for God in the world. As they discipline themselves, people will see Christ in them, and they will become powerful witnesses. Okay? And that's kind of where this fasting is going. It's, it's not demanded of us. There's nowhere in Scripture is it ever saying, that, commanded, that we have to, as Christians, fast. Ever. But it's saying for the purpose of godliness. So in the Christian experience, there are many different spiritual disciplines that lead to greater godliness. Among these are Bible study, scripture memory, meditation, fellowship, and worship attendance. In addition, Christians are also called to fast. Unfortunately, many believers are not familiar with what the Bible teaches about this last spiritual discipline. The purpose of this booklet is to bring that truth to light. And I'm just going to share a little bit of what he has here. Fasting was one of the important keys in Jesus' preparation for public ministry. Uh, Luke 4, 1 to 2 states, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. We will be discussing that next week. That's our topic next week, okay? We're going to talk about Jesus' fast for those 40 days in the wilderness. In the, in the uh, past, when I read the last phrase in Luke 4-2, he became hungry. I chuckled and thought to myself, no kidding. I bet Jesus was famished at the end of 40 days with no food. Actually, I later learned that when a person fasts, for an extended period, certain things happen in the body. The first few days, he craves food. When his body finally realizes that it is not going to get fed by mouth, the hunger mechanism often shuts down. I want to say it does not always shut down. I had a very dear friend, he's now gone, but he believed God wanted him to do some extended fasts. And he never had that hunger thing shut down for his extended fast. He had it the whole time. That was our answer. Um, the person no longer feels hungry, just weak. 
But the body now feeds off what is left in the intestines and colon. This can make a person's breath become foul for a few days. The body also consumes its own fat reserves and begins depleting muscle mass to feed vital organs. As calories are burned with no replacement, the person loses weight. The body also purifies itself, consuming toxins along with other bodily material. As time goes by, several weeks, eventually a person's hunger mechanism switches back on. When it comes on, it is telling the person either eat something soon or you will die. If the person neglects the message, at some point his body will reject food, even if he decides to eat. When the text in Luke says that after 40 days, Jesus became hungry, it means that his hunger mechanism turned back on and told him, eat soon or die. At this point, he broke his fast and the angels ministered to him in Matthew 4, 11. You may remember a drama that unfolded many years ago in Belfast, Ireland. Some prisoners went on a hunger strike and a few of them died. They died after not eating for 50 plus days. Undoubtedly, at some point, their hunger mechanism reignited, but they chose to ignore the message and continue their strike. Soon, they reached the point of no return and died. Jesus' example of fasting is a powerful one. Probably few, if any of us, will ever fast for 40 days, but we will, we will do well to make fasting a regular part of our lives. Um, and that is, that is important to know. I will discuss this stuff more in the nutrition class um, about, about this stuff. If, from, from in the reading I've done, when that hunger mechanism turns on, even if you were planning on for, fasting for 40 days or whatever, and the hunger mechanism turns on, that is the time you need to stop your fast. Okay? You don't say, well, it's only been 30 days. And I wanted to do it for 40 days. I'm going to continue on. Don't. When the hunger mechanism turns back on, that is a signal that your body needs food. Okay? So, I just wanted to point that out. Um, so, out of vogue. Fasting has been out of vogue in Christian churches for centuries. Following the time of the apostles, fasting was an important spiritual discipline. Fasting became popular, unpopular, however, when people began to react to some groups within the church who practiced extreme self-denial known as asceticism. Known as what? Asceticism. Okay? Ascetics would harshly treat their bodies in many ways. Starvation, wearing spiked girdles, self-mutilization, um, sleep depri deprivation, sleep, sleeping sitting up, or standing out in harsh weather for long periods. These people supposed their behavior was a good form of self-denial and brought them closer to God. In reality, much of what they did was nothing more than self-abuse. Mm -hmm. Since the time of the ascetics, Fasting has never regained its rightful place in the church, but it is making a comeback as dedicated Christians learn more about it. Today, most Christians don't fast for a variety of reasons. Some see it as too Spartan. Others say it is not practical in our fast-paced society where people feel they cannot afford to go without eating. Others see it as synonymous with starvation and maltreatment of the body. Some quote Ephesians 5.29, which states, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Since we are to take good care of our bodies and treat them as the temple of the Holy Spirit, some people view fasting as a form of mistreatment and refuse to do it. In rejecting fasting, some use Colossians 2.23, which states, these are man manner, matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Again, they argue that fasting abuses the body 
and is of no real value against fleshly indulgence. They argue that fasting is self-made religion. Obviously, people who make these arguments are taking the verses out of context. I personally believe the main reason why most Christians don't fast is because they've never been taught about biblical fasting. Few churches teach on the subject. If they leave it to the youth group to fast when raising money for world hunger or something like that. The fact is, fasting is all over the Bible and must not be overlooked. In the search I used, in the search to understand it, I followed, um, the following will be explored. Whose voice are we listening to? I'll have to tell you later. You're saying I, I, and I just, it's not It's the author. Okay. It's the author, and I'll have to get back to you because I cut off the first few pages of this because I wasn't going to read it because it was just all of the, okay, the title and the, I'm just asking. And so I can get back to you. I just wanted to know whose thoughts we're hearing. Um, so he's going to cover what fasting is, reasons for fasting, types and links of fasting. We're not going to cover all this today. But um, I do want to go into what fasting is. Um, when someone asks, what is biblical fasting? Someone else replied, fasting is miserable. It is the slowest thing you will ever do. In some ways, this response is quite accurate. Fasting can be miserable and seem to take forever, but there is a good reason for all of this and will be addressed later in this little booklet. I under, to understand fasting, it is important to start in the Old Testament. The Old Testament word for fast is sum, or something like that, and it means to abstain from food. Okay. The New Testament word is nestuo, and it comes from two words, no and food. It literally means no food. Unfortunately, the church has often weakened the word fasting by trying to give it a broader meaning. People equate fasting with the principle of self-denial. They talk about fasting from television, excessive entertainment, or anything that hinders one's relationship with God. And those are all good. But scripture certainly teaches self-denial, but the normal and clear meaning of fasting is to abstain from food. By giving it a broader meaning, its real meaning becomes weakened or lost. Further, circum uh, um, further confirmation that fasting means abstaining from food is found in Jesus' fast mentioned earlier. Listen again to Luke 4, 1 and 2. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they had and when they had ended, he became hungry. Scripture does not say that he drank nothing. Okay? It says that he ate nothing. When um, Satan tempted Jesus, he tempted him with food, not drink. Also, at the end of Jesus' fast, Scripture states that he was hungry, not thirsty. To understand what fasting is, it is also important to understand what it is not. Fasting is not the refusal to eat because one is emotionally upset. In 1 Samuel 1, 7, Hannah refused to eat because she was taunted by her rival Peninnah. In 1 Samuel 20, 34, Jonathan did not eat for a day because he was angry with his father Saul and grieved for his friend David. Saul hurled a spear at Jonathan because Jonathan was friends with David. In 1 Kings 21, 4, Ahab refused to eat because he was upset over not getting Naboth's vineyard. The verse states, So Ahab came into his house sullen and vexed because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. Fasting is also not involuntarily going without food. If a person is in a famine or locked in an enemy prison and does not eat because no food is available, he is not fasting. He may be starving, but not fasting. Biblical fasting may be defined as 
voluntarily abstaining for food for various spiritual and physical reasons, okay? By the way, the first meal of the day is called breakfast. The idea is that a person has been going without food or fasting all night, and he breaks his fast in the morning. This, however, is a bit of a misnomer because people really aren't aware of not eating during the night. Let's uh, now look at some reasons why people fast in the Bible. Okay. Um, I'm not going to cover the first reason um, in just a minute, but something, just a comment here. Something that I, I've never understood is I, I never get up in the middle of the night and eat. However, every time we have guests come to our house and spend the night, my husband always makes sure that they know that there's food in the refrigerator. <laughs> that if they get hungry in the night, they can come and have food. Because he gets up in the night and eats. He has a different metabolism and a different body type than you all together. It's, it's I know, yeah. I don't know they do that. Yeah, but that's like the, the cartoon where is it Dagwood gets up in the middle of the night and makes himself a big sandwich? Oh, how about that? That's true. I so. don't eat in the middle of the night, but I do have hunger pains sometimes in the middle of the night. I don't get up and eat because I have the hunger pains. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, yeah. That's just Some a, people have that. Yeah. yeah. When my previous husband died, I did not eat. I ate nothing. I cooked breakfast for the two of us that morning, and then I didn't eat again because he died three or four hours later. I didn't eat again until, I don't know if it was Wednesday or Thursday, he died on a Sunday. Because I was so convinced that if I ate anything that I would just be sick and I drank tons of water. And my mom came up, I was still in Canada, and she, it freaked her out. Uh, but I was not hungry. Mm -hmm. I was probably still in so much shock. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. She was relieved when I when she when she finally got me to eat something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much I ate until after the funeral, even, but mm -hmm. I wasn't hungry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and when the body's not hungry, like when you get sick. So that was a forward grieving. Same thing happens when you're sick. You're not hungry. I mean, some sometimes you are, sure. but um, some things like. In January, when I got so sick, there was a couple of days I wasn't hungry. Food didn't sound good to me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Because you lose your appetite. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go into this first reason that this person gives of reasons for fasting. And number one is to humble and purify the soul. Mankind has a natural tendency toward pride. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 says that there are six things that God hates. Pride is at the top of the list. Pride and arrogance tend to grow when we have things in abundance. In our culture, it is so easy for us to become prideful because we have so much. It happens to Christians and non-Christians alike. There are few times in our modern society when we are pulled out of our comfort zones. In the United States, we usually have enough food to eat, clothing to cover us, shelter over our heads, and a bed to sleep on. In some ways, compared to most of the world, people might say we have become soft and too comfortable. Fasting helps change all that. It makes our stomachs growl. We feel weak and are more easily agitated. We often begin to have a one-track mind, food, Fasting is a way, and a good way, I might add, that helps us realize just how needy we are. We need food, and it is a greater reminder how fragile life is. It makes us appreciate what we have and what many people in the world don't have. It can help us look up and realize that without God's provision, we would die. When I fast and my stomach growls, I like to pray, Lord, Thank you for pulling me out of my comfort zone. Help me hunger for you each day, like I hunger for food right now. Through this experience, please humble and purify my soul and remind me how needy I am of you and how much I need you. Um, use this 
time of fasting to help me focus more on you. Listen to what Moses said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 8.3. He, which is God, humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which, he, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Here's the reason. That he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. God allowed the children of Israel to be hunger, hungry in order to humble them and make them rely more on him. Another helpful insight about how food influences the spiritual state of man is found in the book of Ezekiel. When I think of the city of Sodom, when we think of the city of Sodom, we associate it with the sin of homosexuality. Although it is accurate, Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50 states, I guess, further insight. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and needy. Thus, Ezekiel what? Ezekiel 16, 16. 49 and 50. Thus they were haughty and committed um, abominations before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. The verse indicates that having abundant food contributed to making the people of Sodom selfish and insensitive to the things of God and indifferent to the needs of those around them. Having an abundance can do the same for us. Another important passage that connects spirituality with food is Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 14, yeah. where Moses warned the people not to forget God when they went into the promised land. The verse states, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, and have built good houses and lived in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is apparent that when people are physically satisfied, they often forget God. Mm -hmm. Fasting is also connected with the Day of Atonement. It was to be a permanent ordinance for the Jewish people. Leviticus 16, 29 through 31 states, This shall be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month. You shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. Now, the, this goes into um, the different languages, the way it's been translated. The New Testament Standard Version of the Bible translates the word fasting. It should be fasting here. It translates it humbling your souls. Okay? In, in the Hebrew, it was fasting. The King James calls it afflicting your souls. The New International Version translates it denying yourselves. Indeed, fasting involves humbling, afflicting, and denying um, oneself. Fasting makes a person realize how fragile he is and how much he depends and needs God's daily provision. Perhaps this is one reason why Jesus taught his um, followers to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Matthew That's 6. Kind of a little bit of irrelevant but, um, in the same subject. Is the Day of Atonement the only day given on the Lord's Feast and Fast that's in the sign time of fast? For the, right. for the Jews, it's the only assigned fast. I thought so. I went looking for that, and I thought so. Okay. okay. And then the, the Leviticus 16 passage. Yeah, that's Leviticus 16, 13 or something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Uh, at other times, I will go into some of these other reasons that he gives for fasting, but we don't have time today. Um, I just, this might be a time to mark, <laughs> but with abundance, and yeah, we have all this abundance, and also back earlier today when we talked about not being able to think and so on and so forth, I think the men's retreat are getting too much food. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the reasons they come, though. <laughs> you know, but I they, they might just, say, but that's what, that's what went in my head, is retreat still is enough. Okay, but if you look at what the Bible, okay, there, um, okay, maybe I shouldn't say it's in the Bible, but <clears throat> a lot of times the fast, a fast would precede a feast. Mm -hmm. So Esther, they fasted for three days because they were going to be all wiped out. And then after that, when they weren't wiped out, they celebrated. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it would be appropriate for the men to fast prior to the retreat, right. and then this would be their feast. Yeah, that's what would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, who's going to tell Marty that? <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and even if you tell Marty that, I mean, it's nothing that's required. <laughs> so it's not, you know. It was just, and it, it said something about that, that you couldn't think and you couldn't learn and you couldn't you know, so on and so forth, because you've just eaten this huge meal and going, well, how is this, how is everything, these women is getting into their, or whatever you want to call them, into their heads that they've just eaten this big spaghetti meal or whatever. That's I'm what, just, that's, what that's just for my brain. It's yeah. just my brain went. I'm sorry. I know that's what happens to me because, you know, your body goes into all the digestion and takes all the energy to do that. But, you know, I, I'm, but it's just, they wouldn't get anything if they were sitting in church with their bellies grumbling. Either. <laughs> thinking about deer coming up and, and smelling it on the barbecue out there. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 And, and slapping on them too, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's being hospitable. It's, mm -hmm. These right. people well, came I, from it, all it just It's just something that went through my day. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And of course, some of the guys can't. They have medical reasons, so right. they should not. So right, right. Not judging. Right. So anyway, um, that's all I have for today. Okay. Are there any other comments or things that you want to bring up? Nope. Thank you. <laughs> I don't see necessarily commands to us to fast. I mean, there are no commands. I find here reasons to fast for myself, mm -hmm. but I I don't know that a collect. I don't necessarily want to do a collective fast. I don't want to fast with other but, people for a specific. But reason. Jesus does say when he was talking about the Pharisees and how they fasted for show. Oh, he yeah. says, when you fast. Mm -hmm. So it's not a commandment, but he recognizes that they probably would do it. It's a regular practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they go out and, you know, dirty themselves up on purpose, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, when he's, you know, like, yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else before we close? Okay, let's close. Our gracious Heavenly Father. I just want to thank you for these things that we are learning. And Lord, we do want a heart after you. We do want to have that intimate relationship with you that um, is stronger than what we have now. And Lord, I just pray that you will um, help each of us and, and guide each one of us in, in what you would have us to do to draw close to you. And uh, fasting can be used that way. And Lord, I just, uh, if people choose to to fast on Wednesdays or whatever they choose to do, Lord, that you would honor them for, for their um, dedication to you and setting aside things, um, food or other things, to spend that time with you and get to know you better. And I just thank you that you, you love to work through things like that when people lay aside things to spend time with you. And I thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Catholic Church says you have to fast at least an hour before taking communion, and they call.